Coming up on DTNS, are all the tech people leaving Silicon Valley? How Sony's new image sensor will make for fast, cheap, and safer cameras. And what can Norway tell us about the return of theater? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 14th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us today, very happy to have back on the show, Chris Mancini, writer and podcaster. Chris, welcome back. Great to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're going to be uh, digging in a little bit into the idea of whether we'll just keep streaming stuff at home or will we want to return to the theaters? And does Norway point the way in that direction? Uh, we were also just talking about all of our, our pandemic era behaviors from, from haircutting uh, to bread making on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that show, become a member, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced a tab grouping feature is coming to its Chrome browser. Tab groups are created by right-clicking on a tab and then assigning it a name and a color, which will then show under all tabs within the group. The feature is available now in the latest Chrome beta and rolling out more broadly next week. Nintendo announced that Paper Mario Origami King will be added to the fold of Switch games July 17th. It's mm -hmm. the first major title Nintendo has announced for the summer. Apple confirmed it has acquired Next VR, a startup that streams sports and some other content to virtual reality headsets. Uh, they have partnerships with Facebook, Sony, HTC, and Lenovo, among others. Uh, Next VR has deals with the NBA and Fox Sports as well, but now they're Apple's. China Mobile International, Facebook, Global Connect, Orange, STC, Telecom Egypt, Vodafone, and WIOCC have all partnered together to build Two Africa, that's two, the number two, Africa, the most comprehensive subsea cable to serve the African continent and Middle East region to date. Alcatel Submarine Networks has been appointed to build the 37,000 kilometer long cable to interconnect Europe through Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and 21 landings of 16 African countries to Africa as expected to go live in 2023 or 2024. Mac Observer's Charlotte Henry notes that Netflix and other streamers continue to downgrade HD video in Europe and the UK. The downgrade was announced two months ago as, one, as a one-month measure, measure to avoid internet congestion. Netflix told Variety that it will lift the caps on a country-by-country -country basis as network conditions improve. And Twitch announced a new eight-person council of both experts and Twitch creators. That's not throwing shade on the creators. They, you know, there's two different categories. Uh, called the Twitch Safety Advisory Council to guide decision-making around new policies and products. Twitch says this will allow communities to thrive on Twitch, particularly at a time that the platform is seeing record levels of engagement and streaming. All right, let's talk about uh, NVIDIA's big uh, GPU announcement, the Ampere architecture uh, for scientific computing, cloud graphics, data analytics. Uh, this is something you're probably not going to buy to put in your machine, mostly because it's $199,000. The A100 <laughs> is the largest 7 nanometer processor yet and can run several different programs on one chip, which is great for data centers with virtual machines and matches a capability Intel has had for a while. The first DGX A100 systems are shipping. The US Argonne National Laboratory will be using it to run applications researching COVID-19. Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Dell, and Alibaba are all on board too. As I said, the systems start at $199,000. That's the DGX A100 system that combines eight of the Ampere graphics cards into one. Uh, and NVIDIA argues that that high price is worth it because you could replace 75 $5,000 servers with one of these eight chip systems. NVIDIA also announced, I think more significantly, or at least it'll have more impact on us directly, that it's shifting focus from autonomous cars to driver assistance tech. Uh, the Orin chips that NVIDIA launched in December will be used in a single architecture for all levels of automation. They're not abandoning self-driving cars, uh, but they're saying this, this is very significant because it's NVIDIA saying, yeah, we don't think those are going to be uh, hitting wide use anytime soon. And we want to sell chips to the things that are going to be in wide use, which are these driver assistants that are coming to more and more models of cars. That's really smart. I mean, as I've got a car, my Volvo, uh, my most recent car, that is it's not autonomous, <laughs> but there are some semi-autonomous functions where I'm like, this is magic, but I'm driving the car. I mean, it's just, it's just a cool version of the car that I was buying anyway. So 
the more that that can be added on to packages for consumers makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've seen so much slowdown and right now the current landscape is just weird, but you know, the, the autonomous car is being like, okay, well, when are they going to be ready to not have a human driver behind the wheel? Uh, you know, maybe there, that needs to be rethought a little bit. Um, question, layman question. Mm -hmm. How much of this is branding? How much of this is shared tech in terms of autonomous cars and, 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 and driving assist that, uh, that these chips would be used for it's just now this this is a a a different version of it, a different version of how to sell it yeah no some of some of it is is branding uh, and a lot of it is marketing in other words yeah. telling the the automakers like hey uh our our chips our orange chips can be used for for this too let's let's help you what can we do to put an nvidia chip inside your car today <laughs> exactly yeah what do i gotta tell you to get an Nvidia chip inside we've got your these car boxes right in the storehouse you know we can't just let them go to waste just think of something else guys come on let me let me let me go back and talk to my manager he just told me that we can do it with self-driving cars not just autonomous orange <laughs> chips are usually reserved for the self-driving cars but i think in this case uh, yeah no it's it's a smart pivot uh it doesn't require a, i'm sure it requires some technological uh retooling but it it's it's not it's not a huge leap for nvidia to do this and i think it's a big signal that with autonomous cars not even out there testing on the roads right now, uh, it's it's going to be even longer before they become practical. And all the cars will run an open GL. Yes. Is that what will happen? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> The U.S. Senate voted 77 to 19 to adopt an amendment increasing legal protections uh, for targets of government surveillance, including ending permission to obtain phone records of U.S. citizens in terrorism probes. An amendment would have required probable cause and a warrant for browsing and search history failed by one vote. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, dates back to the mid-1970s, has been used in government terrorism surveillance for some time now. Much of it expired on March 15th. 15th. The bill is expected to be passed Thursday. Then it goes to the House. Uh, all right. <clears throat> uh, a couple things here. Number one, in terms of the FISA uh, warrants, I I'm kind of surprised that we have not seen more pushback on FISA, specifically because it is at the heart of some of the surveillance of the Trump campaign. Obviously, the, there is now a Trump White House. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see why that, that has not trickled down to the Senate, although the White House and the Senate uh, Republicans have not always been on the same page. That being said, it's not shocking that this has gotten rubber stamped and we, we don't know how it's going to fare in the House or whether or not Trump will indeed try to uh, veto it when it comes to his desk. But get ready for much more of these kinds of digital civil liberty conversations that we are going to see over the next 10 years. Because not only FISA dates back for, for a while, but a lot of these powers that have been enhanced come from the Patriot Act. And that was, you know, now 20 years ago, close to 20 years ago, and we are still seeing rubber stamped uh, uh, approvals of some of the expanded powers that we gave the intelligence community. We are about to see another wave of that, this time not for terrorist attacks that could happen at any time, but for tracing and mitigation of uh, illnesses. Uh, uh, this is This is going to be something that we will see a lot more of. So you're saying this is this this debate here is just a, a tiny taste, just a preview uh, of what we're going to see because it it was a it was a hard thought to try to get uh, the requirement for a warrant to be applied to browsing and search history. Right now, they can just be bulk collected. They still have to show relevance to a case in order to look at them, but it's much easier to do that than to have to prove probable and, cause. Uh, and that's the kind of fight we're going to see about a lot of these other issues. And by the way, yeah, uh, uh, the, the getting a FISA warrant can at times be laughably easy if you have seen some of this stuff kind of come to light. Uh, uh, but absolutely, look, uh, uh, we we are, there is no doubt in my mind we are going to see a push for surveillance technology because people are terrified, rightly so, about COVID-19. Sony announced the IMX500 image sensor, which combines processing and memory on the same sensor to perform machine learning powered computer vision tasks without needing additional hardware. So you don't have to have a separate AI chip. You don't have to send it to the cloud for processing. It can improve picture quality, detect people and objects all on its own. 
Sony oh, says the chip can apply the MobileNet V1 image recognition algorithm to a single video frame in 3.1 milliseconds compared to separate chips like Intel's Movidius, which takes hundreds of milliseconds. So this thing's super fast. The upshot is faster, cheaper, and more secure computer vision for single application uses. At first, this means faster sensors for factory robots, the, the so-called cobots that, that need to be really safe and be able to tell where the people are so they can work closer in, uh, secure health imaging, uh, so you're not having to send health images into the cloud. They can just stay on the device that's scanning you. Uh, uh, retail implementation at things like Amazon Go, the cashierless convenience store, it'd be cheaper to implement. And eventually it'll come to your phone. Uh, IMX 500 test samples are shipping now with products using the sensor to arrive first quarter of 2021 in the industrial sector, in the retail sector. Uh, but down the line, these sensors would show up in your phone. And again, meaning they would be able to say, oh, that's a person. I'm going to apply this kind of approach to this photography because it's a person and not have to send a picture of that person or a definition of that person to the cloud. They could just do it right on the image sensor. It wouldn't even have to go to an AI chip. So it's so nice it to be reminded. Like Go ahead, oh, Chris. I was going to say, so sounds like um, it's not going to be Skynet. It's going to be a smart camera that's going to enslave humanity. Right. It lit individual smart cameras yeah, will all enslave because, us individually. It's distributed enslavement. Because they can think on their own. That's perfect. That's mm -hmm. what you want. You want a camera that knows exactly when to take your picture. Uh, at least it's in your hand instead yeah. of up there. Out of <laughs> I had a slightly more, uh, I don't know, cheerful version where I was like, <laughs> oh, you know, my, my first reaction was like, well, I want it in my phone. I want the coolest sensor. Well, yeah, as anybody with, with any photography knowledge knows, sometimes that doesn't exactly make us all better photographers. But it's nice to be reminded that there are many sectors that the sort of technology goes into where, and it might be something that we use every day and we'll begin to use more and more of her just like it's so great thanks for that company for having this technology that i don't understand that does something kind of cool this is the type of technology from sony that you know ends up getting bought and put into products the da the downside if there's a downside to this is that uh and th this may make you feel better chris uh it can only do one thing so you can train it to be like lo you're looking for like in a camera on your phone to to look for and identify objects and people but it can't do other stuff it can't break out and 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 reason about other things or or <laughs> even perform just what it wants tasks. you to think <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but that is a limitation to it so it's not a multi-purpose sensor that could do a lot of stuff you'll still need a separate chip if you want that sort of thing. Mm. Business Week reports that Bay Area median housing price is double the national level at $600,000. Now, anybody who lives in the Bay Area is like, yeah, we knew that, but everybody else might be like, that's a lot. Combine that with people working from home, and we're seeing a lean towards people considering maybe moving away from the costly Bay Area. Companies report that employees have been asking about it. Moving cost calculator at movebuddha.com says that 90% of requests involving the Bay Area have been for outbound moves, not internal or inbound. Business Week's Sarah Fryer raises the question of whether this might lead to lower salaries for workers who move to a less expensive location and whether companies will start hiring people from farther afield. Well, I, 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 I happen to know somebody who was just hired at a company based in the Bay Area, in fact, based in San Francisco proper, and uh, they said, yeah, gosh, uh, I'll, you know, because of this situation, I was hired while a lot of people are working from home and the company's a startup, but trying to figure out how this all works going forward. And they have floated the idea of, okay, well, not everybody can just work from home forever, but we can maybe stagger salaries based on where your physical location is to kind of make the whole thing more fair and also to, you know, make the company able to, to scale because, that was one of the sort of strange things about Bay Area companies or anywhere where it's very expensive to live in general is in order to get talent, you had to give them these astronomical packages so that they could afford to live there in the first place. And you also have office buildings that are cost a fortune every month just to uh, maintain and rent. So if you have a smaller footprint on your workforce, you know, you don't need as big of a building. So you're looking at ways you could cut that cost with remote working and smaller footprint. Uh, I'm sure they're looking at everything combined. Well, yeah, I mean, 
a lot of the biggest companies that do the biggest amounts of hiring, you know, they they build status campuses or they build status headquarters in in San Francisco. It's going to be curious to see how much that matters going forward. But I'm more interested in this idea that remote work is something that has been pioneered by Bay Area companies. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, tech companies have been at the forefront of the. Uh, a unlimited vacation, unlimited work from home kind of uh, movement that have their own little complications. But I wonder whether or not some of that will eventually trickle down to what Sarah said that, okay, sure, you can have a Bay Area salary if you live in the Bay Area. If you live in Bakersfield, if you live in Omaha, if you live in Pensacola, then you, we are going to pay you Pensacola, Omaha, Bakersfield money uh, on, on top of whatever we would pay you just to do the work. That is a very, very interesting concept that I'm curious to see uh, uh, play out. Or if I mean, part of the reason why Bay Area salaries are so high aren't only because of the uh, cost of living. It's also because there is a race for brains. There has always been a race for brains. I don't think that that will diminish now that more things go online. So whether or not cost-cutting measures are in the immediate future, I almost wonder whether or not the the race for uh, the talent will erase that going forward. That's really that's an interesting way to look at this because on the one hand, uh, if you know your worker now uh, lives in the house they bought for one hundred sixty thousand dollars across the street from where I grew up uh, in Greenville, Illinois, it's 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 reasonable for the company to say, look, your cost of living is not the same. Like the salary package doesn't have to be the same. And then add to that the fact that, plus we also can hire people from that same area now where we couldn't before without co-location. Uh, I know there's going to be companies talking about, you know, maybe even providing re relocation fees to say like, look, we'll pay for your move to the cheaper area. But <laughs> right, we, the we make it better house. in the long run. <laughs> They yeah, would actually yeah, pay yeah. somebody to move further away from the company. Yeah, you work from <laughs> home, we'll pay you to move there, but your salary goes down because mm -hmm. you don't need as much and we want to save that money. Well, I mean, obviously the companies want to save money. That's the bottom line across the board. You know, I'm sure, you know, some of them are all very nice people, but you know, that's that's the reality. But for a lot of I don't know, it depends on where you are in life, particularly people with families or who have various reasons that they have a hard time being attached to a physical place where they're, you know, maybe it's their dream job, but it's not necessarily their dream life. And to be mm. able to reimagine what you might have wanted had you had the option before you took the job, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I will say the one wrinkle in that for anyone deciding to move is if you're in the stage where you still want to maybe hop to another company that does the same or similar work, it's far easier to do it when the company's down the street from the company you work at versus, oh, I need to fly back all the way to the barrier from wherever location I now live in because I want to work remotely and then convince them, hey, I want to work remotely and do the same job and see if you get anywhere with that. Well, you can just interview remotely too. I don't know if that really makes that much of a difference. I'm more, I'm more I curious uh, how many of these people really are going to move. Uh, and even the ones who do, how many of them are going to realize that it wasn't the beautiful uh, escape that they imagined? And they miss the the certain quirks of the Bay Area that you can't find everywhere else. People get used to what they have, right? And it, yeah. and I've moved around a lot, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of used to it. But I know a lot of people find it disconcerting the first time they move away from somewhere. HBO has partnered with a startup called Scener, S-C-E-N-E-R, to offer a Chrome browser extension that lets you co-watch HBO shows with folks over the in internet, similar to Netflix Watch Party. Scener lets up to 20 people watch and not only do uh, text chat, but also audio and video chat as well. In fact, Scener is considering larger groups and is talking all kinds of things like, oh, we want to do what Twitch does with tips and shout outs. So Scener may have some, some bigger ambitions here. But right now, 20 people watching an HBO show together. Everybody has to have an HBO subscription for this to work. Uh, Scener's Google Chrome extension supports HBO Now and HBO Go for Mac OS, Windows PC, and Chromebook. 
Uh, Senior's primary investor, I just had to include this, is Real Networks. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> uh, so they're still around and investing, and they uh, one of their startups that they're investing in is partnered with HBO. I mean, the uh, the Netflix Watch uh, party at Chrome Extension, I don't believe had any official uh, connection with Netflix. So it's interesting to see HBO seek this out and say, let's let's do a deal to have you do this for us. I think I think it makes sense. And it's also something that can be added as a selling point. Obviously, HBO Max will be the new offering from the company. I would assume that this would be a part of that, that you can say, hey, join with your family. Watch this with your friends and family now that we are in a more telecommuting uh, or tele telecommunication society. They're trying to sweeten the deal for HBO Max for sure. They're, this is not going to work with HBO Max at launch, by all indications. Sadly. <laughs> um, which, but, but yeah, at some point, I think you're both right. It has to, right? That has to be one of the things that they they eventually get around. They are, to they are not they are not buying this so they could not have it be a part of the yeah. suite of why you would want to use it. And and furthermore, that part of the advantage of them being directly involved in it is they can make it a a better and more seamless experience and a more feature rich experience. Well, and that's because we do like to watch things with each other, uh, even if we can't be in the same place as each other. Let's talk a little more about that. First, though, get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes by subscribing to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Uh, theaters are reopening now, and the question is, how much do we really want to watch with other people in the same location, especially strangers? Uh, they've reopened in some U.S. cities, other smaller chains turning to online, Alamo Drafthouse Theaters launching Alamo On Demand with special Q&As trying to capture that ability. Uh, but around the world, theaters opening. Spain, tentatively May 25th. Germany's uh, states, May 18th through the 30th. Netherlands, June 1st with a 30-person limit. The UK trolled us by saying no earlier than July 4th. Uh, and Korea's already open. Korea and uh, CJ, CGV, and Lotte Cinemas doing contactless service. They nicknamed it Untact. You order your food through an app or a kiosk. It's delivered with LED-controlled pickup boxes. You get tickets through your app. Uh, and uh, Rainy Day in New York from Woody Allen uh, took the top box office last week, knocking Trolls World Tour to second. But let's talk Norway. Yeah. This weekend. <laughs> Apparently Me Too hasn't made its way to Korea. <laughs> 15% of Norway's cinemas reopened with restrictions of 50 seats per screen. Ringen Kino in Oslo sold 96% of its available tickets. That led to it getting about half the average admissions it gets, because it usually doesn't fill up all the theaters. Right. Uh, so when it's allowed to sell all of its seats, it sells about double that. The top grossing title was Onward, followed by Bloodshot, The Gentleman, Parasite, and local titles Cloven 3, the final, and Fluchten Vergrenzen. Uh, evening screenings in the early part of this week have been about 70%, and that's usually when you get nobody coming to the theater, and screenings for Parasite this coming week are sold out. Now, what they're doing is staggering the showtimes to try to keep people from crowding into the lobby. Uh, concessions are still sold by people, but they're kept under control. So popcorn is refilled and stored separately. They don't have a, out in a big open thing. Uh, they give you a coffee cup to get your coffee rather than leaving the coffee cups by the machine, but there's still a machine out there. That's interesting. The cinemas are expecting some small releases coming in June, and Norway's theaters counting on big releases in July to fill the gap. They plan to run some classic movies. In fact, uh, the owner of Ringen Kino, Nordish Film Kino, told Deadline, we're quite sure that some big children's movies will surprise us by releasing early in July. They're more worried about having too many films when the glut happens at the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021. So, Chris, I don't know about you, but this is not what I would have expected. I would not have expected uh, sellouts, even of limited amounts. And I certainly wouldn't expect theaters to be hinting that we will get earlier releases than we thought. Um, I, yeah, I think there's a couple things going on here and it might be, you know, being misinterpreted <laughs> a little bit by the data. I think one of the things that's going on is people just want to get out and no matter what it is, even if it's a movie theater, bully, it doesn't matter. They want to go out. So there's part of that, but also it's a, um, uh, it's a desire to get back to normalcy. And it's also, of course, it's a love for cinema too, but what, what, there's a lot of moving parts here. 
Like, even if you're staggering seats, like, do people have to, especially in this country, are people going to have to wear masks? How do you keep people from congregating in the lobbies? Like, you could stagger show times, but, you know, we have arc lights with, like, 12, 14 theaters. That's that's impossible. You can't do that for, for us. Um, the other side of the equation is movie theaters were in trouble to begin with before the pandemic because of the way uh, lower attendance and the way studios are releasing their movies now. I mean... You, you guys talked about the row with um, AMC and Universal. And if you look back at that, how ridiculous Univer uh, AMC's response was, thinking that Universal was the only studio thinking about changing how they release movies. No, it's all of them are thinking about it. So I think what you're going to see is, you know, and I've, I've been in love with the cinema since I was a, a, a tiny little child. So I'd hate to see movie theaters go away or even... Uh, you know, get diminished in any way. But I think there's there's going to be kind of a, after an initial push, an initial, like, everyone wants to go back out and see movies again, I think it's going to level off. I think you are going to see the same thing here, like, when they do reopen, that people are going to want to go out. But with the restrictions and the lower capacity, it's going to sound a little bit more like a success than it really is, because you also have the distribution models of the theaters and the movie studios, the split isn't really conducive to what the studio wants. And with concessions and capacity is really what the movie theaters need. So you kind of have like a bit of an impasse between uh, attendance, cost, licensing fees, and the way movies are being released. So I think all of these things needed to be figured out before we could kind of see like a kind of like a return to any kind of uh, equilibrium with the the movie theaters. Yeah, that's my rant. <laughs> I, 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 I do think that part of this is going to be nostalgia. People, uh, you know, there was a, a Supreme Court situation in, in Wisconsin that temporarily or likely temporarily struck down their stay at home order and people were in bars because people yes. want to be bars because they remember mm -hmm. the time that they were there. Forget your personal feelings on whether or not they should be. The desire is what matters in this particular case. I think we are going to see probably larger and more vociferous movie attendance in this country when we are allowed to do it and in the in the shorter capacities. But uh, whether or not that is enough to save the theater industry, I think remains to be seen. And well, also, and I mean, there's a big thing on that art article that you just said, like, well, we're getting a bunch of kids' movies. Now, that's another thing. Are parents going to be taking all their kids that seems the to least. the theaters? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and especially if they have to wear masks, which they're not going to want to do, and, and with the safety issue. But also, you've got all these options for streaming now. And, uh, you know, we mentioned Onward. It did really well. Well, Onward came to Disney Plus here. So all our kids saw it on the streaming service anyway. So you've, you've got, uh, and these are always big, huge summer money makers. is the animated and the family PG-13, PGs, and, and kids movies. So um, they're going to be a big part of the equation moving forward. Yeah, I, I think this is interesting because of the numbers, but it's also one theater in Oslo, and they're going to yes. start opening more of their theaters next week. It'll be very interesting to see when that compressed demand, we're like, this is the only theater all of Oslo can go to. Right. That's that's a whole different situation than, okay, now you got three or four. And at mm -hmm. that point, when do, when do you hit, when do you run out of the people who are like, yeah, I'm not worried. I just want to get out. I just want to go right. somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you start going into the people that you're going to have to convince like right. to say like, hey, man, I can watch HBO with my friends over the Internet at home right now. HBO Nordic. Uh, yeah. You know, why? Why would I why would I go to a theater? So I, HBO I think, ice. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we don't know where that line is yet. That's, yeah. No. And, and, and we won't until you've opened a few more and a few more yeah. and a few more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hey, thanks true. to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Lots of movie talk there, as well as the larger tech conversation. You could submit stories that you care about and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it, Dan, from surprisingly sunny, but I can't tell because I work for the NHS and I've been living in databases for six weeks, Bristol, UK. <laughs> <laughs> Dan says, a few days ago, Sarah mentioned that the new reply all storm protection feature that uh, Microsoft had announced might be kind of a interesting idea and tom said well how many 5000 recipient re recipient reply alls have you been on and everybody on the panel that day was like okay i guess none of us well dan says i had the pleasure of experiencing this incident in november of 2016 where half a billion emails were generated 
in just 75 minutes across the NHS email network. A presumably now unemployed contractor misconfigured a local distribution list to include at NHS.net, meaning that all 850,000 users were added to the test message that was then sent. Dan says, then there followed the inevitable, the inevitable storm of, why am I on this list? Please remove me from this list. And the classic, please stop using reply all, but was sent using reply to all. At one point, I was receiving over 800 messages per minute, which was the point I decided to go for a very long coffee break. To pass the time, and because they have a dark sense of humor, our in-house geographical information system team leapt into action, plotting the location of the worst offenders for reply to all. And why am I receiving this, et cetera? He actually sent us some interesting uh, images of a map that was uh, was put into place because of the incident. Well, yeah, those were some funny graphs. They used emojis, you know, for the angry people <laughs> and the people replying to all, telling people not to reply to all. Uh, it's funny stuff. So, yeah, there we go. Now we know. There's there's one person who's lived through the storm and appreciates yeah. that new Outlook feature. Uh, uh, by the way, if you want to Google ESPN reply all, there was a famous thing that got chronicled by Deadspin where all of the ESPN employees got on a reply all. And uh, if you are a fan of sports media, you will enjoy some of the trollish replies that came to it. Yeah. Uh, lesson is don't put asterisk before an at sign. <laughs> uh, you know what you should do, though? Uh, become a master or grand master patron. And we'd like to shout out a few of you today. Mark Gibson, Dr. Carmine M. Bailey, and Mike McLaughlin. Hey, thanks to Chris Mancini for being with us today. Chris, where can people keep up with your work? Um, I just launched a new company and website. It's called uh, whitecatentertainment.com. You could find my, uh, my podcast there and my books. But most importantly, I have a Kickstarter going until uh, May 31st. This is one I talked about last time I was here. This is Rise of the Kung Fu Dragon Master. It's an action comedy, kind of like Big Trouble in Little China. It's a follow-up to my last comic book that uh, Tom is holding, Long Ago and Far Away. <laughs> it was kickstarted. It came out. It's out now from Starburns Press, the Rick and Morty people. And you could check that out at Comixology if you want to check out my work before pledging. But please pledge. It's a uh, We only have two weeks left, but we're, we're getting very close. We're less than 3,000 away from goal. We're about 63, 64% funded, but we need your help. I know a lot of people from, uh, you know, your show have always supported, so I really appreciate it. But we didn't quite get there last time, so we retooled and we redid it. And in the middle of a pandemic, I thought that was a good idea. But uh, so <laughs> yeah, why but not? We, um, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what we did is we made it easier and cheaper, and we broke the book up into two parts. So we wanted to kind of make it, uh, we made it a no contact project. One of the things that Kickstarter has is a inside voices kind of thing. So there's no shows, there's no um, contact rewards. We got rid of all the tours and all the people will be working separately. So it's a really fun action comedy, Rise of the Kung Fu Dragon Master. You could get there through whitecatentertainment.com or just go to Kickstarter and search the title. Very cool. Uh, well, thanks for being with us. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, where can people find the rest of your fabulous work? Well, of course, you can find my politics podcast, Politics, 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 uh, which yesterday had uh, an interview with the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Check that out now, which uh, might also be gracing the DTNS feed uh, uh, if, if uh, folks would just like that a little bit later in the week. But uh, uh, go ahead and check it out now if you are interested. Uh, great conversation uh, about the future of where the EFF is looking, specifically in the coming years, like I, I mentioned before about the uh, digital rights and uh, where they like and don't like some of the solutions that have been pitched so far, including immunity passports and contact tracing. So check that out, Politics, 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 wherever you get your podcasts or politicspoliticspolitics.com. Thanks to everybody who supports us on Patreon, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. And huge thanks to everybody who's been reviewing us in the Apple Podcast Store. We've been seeing those reviews come in, and it's really great. Uh, so keep those coming if you haven't got to it yet. Review, 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 or at least just leave stars, uh, even if you don't have anything to write. It still helps us get discovered by other folks. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love your emails. Keep them coming. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. We'd love to have you join us live, so please do so and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club, hold
hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>